Hi. Right, when I arrived this morning, I was definitely thinking this. Why am I here in front of all these eminent people? Basically, I'm going to talk to you about uh, my experiences as a practice standards inspector for the college, um, and before that for BSAVA, and why clinical governance is now such an important um, area for, for practitioners. And we're asking practitioners to do things, and I'm not sure that all of them know what we're asking them to do, and we're asking them to look at the evidence base, so I think it's important that, that they know what they're looking for. So, um, I apologise to the uh, President and everyone from the College for putting uh, Catherine Tate and the Code to Professional Conduct on the same slide, but <laughs> why, why, why should practitioners, why should we in practice, and, and I'm still um, work as a locum in practice, why, why should we be bothered about evidence-based evidence -based medicine? Well, the new code that came out in April this year said that veterinary surgeons and veterinary nurses must ensure that clinical governance forms part of their professional activities. That's quite easy to say, but I think an awful lot of practices still don't really know what that means. And an awful lot of practices, even within practice standards scheme, that have had this requirement for a few years now are not quite sure what we want them to do. So what is clinical governance? It's a framework to enable the practice to deliver good quality care, which is surely what everybody wants to do. It's not rocket science. It's what everybody in practice has been doing for years. It's about looking at what you do, seeing if you can do it better, having good communication in the practice, having good systems. But it does require to have a bit more recording than perhaps we've done in the past. We've always done case discussions, but probably we didn't used to document them as much. Um, and if you don't document things, you can't follow them up. So we expect practices to have a framework to see that they're delivering good quality care. And if you look at the very, very good um, guidance to the Code of Conduct, which I know that um, various people here have been involved in, including Bradley and Sally and drawing up, um, it'll tell you that you need to consider animal safety. Well, obviously, as veterinary, veterinary surgeons, that's most important that we consider animal safety. Also, clinical effectiveness, which I'll come on to in a second, and the experience for the patient and for the client. Don't, don't forget about that. As I say, there's excellent guidance to the code, and I'd really recommend, if you haven't seen it, the code is tiny now, but the guidance is massive. And there's a, but it's on the, on the web and easy to, to see. Now, there's actually a piece in the guidance, um, and the, good, the guidance... It's not only for practices, but there's also individual guidance, what you as, a, as an individual veterinary surgeon should do, which I think is good because you could be working in a practice that haven't got this framework in place. So it's things like keeping up with your CPD, um, knowing your own limitations, knowing when to refer things. But there's also in there, it actually says, and I've brought it so I can read it, um, that clinical governance may include for an individual critically analysing the evidence base for procedures used and making appropriate changes to practice. Now, if we're going to ask people to do this in their guidance and in the code, then they need to know where they can find this evidence that they're going to look at and appraise, and they need to know if they're going to make changes as a result um, that the evidence they're using is reliable. So I say in the practice standards scheme, there has been a requirement for clinical governance for quite a while now, and it actually says, must have a system in place for monitoring and discussing the clinical outcomes of cases and for acting on the results. And I think that's the important thing, for acting on the results, not just for having discussions, but actually doing something about it. So when we go around to practices, uh, as practice inspectors are often asking, if you can give them some idea of what, what we expect them to do. So we expect them to hold practice meetings. They can be face-to-face -face meetings. Uh, they can be um, email groups or, or go on, on Moodle and all participate um, in discussions that way. But it's important to have case discussions. And as I said before, it's also important to document the case discussions and so you can have actions as a result and follow up on the actions so at next meetings you can see what's happened. So not just the practice meetings that we've all been to, I think, where it's, you know, please charge properly and please don't park your car there and where are we going to go for Christmas dinner, but practice meetings where cases are actually discussed. 
Obviously, information from CPD meetings um, is important, that if someone's gone on CPD, that they communicate it to the rest of the team, and that's very important. I think one of the most important things um, practices can do for clinical governance is carry out significant event reviews. So when things go wrong, and, and you know, in practice things do go less than optimally, shall we say, so it can be that they go seriously wrong, like an anaesthetic death, it could be um, an MRSA case. It could just be a, an unexpected outcome of a surgical or medical procedure. It could be a serious complaint from a client or an accident that's happened in the practice. But it's really important that as a result of that, there's a, a very soon afterwards a no blame, and that's really important, a no blame meeting where everybody can honestly input to what's happened. And as a result of that, think, is there anything they could have done differently? and what changes can be made as a result. Now, as part of this, it may well be that if it is the dreaded anaesthetic death, and for instance, it's maybe a rabbit that's died under the anaesthetic, that the practice are going to go away and look at the um, practice protocol for rabbit anaesthesia. And in order to do that, they're going to look at the available literature and see if what they're doing um, is the best thing to be done at the time. So that's why it's important. Other ideas is which is very relevant to today, is drawing up clinical guidelines or protocols. I think practices like guidelines better, that's better as a word than protocols. Protocol sounds a bit like it's um, imposed from the top, and I think it's very important that these follow on team discussion and looking at evidence. And don't forget that all these discu uh, case discussions um, and drawing up the guidelines and protocols all counts as CPD, so don't forget to put it down. Clinical audit as well, very important. Um, obviously, practices can do outcome audits, so they can look at um, post-operative complications. Um, and the, there's a very, very good um, example audit on the VET audit website where, where you can classify post-op complications from one to five, from um, you know, loss to follow-up through to medical, surgical complications through to death unfortunately. Or you can do process audits where you take the protocols that you've drawn up and see how they're applied. So um, if you've got a protocol for how often you monitor hypothyroid cats, then you actually um, audit how, how, how you're complying with that protocol. Or a protocol for cleaning, say, after maybe after an MRSA outbreak. So that's, that's important and that's the VET audit website address. So clinical effectiveness, which they've asked us to do in, in the guidance to clinical governance, measures how well a particular procedure achieves the desired outcome. And obviously that's important. We need to know that what we're doing in practice is being effective. And for practices to be clinically effective, they need access to the best evidence. So that's why I think today is so important. And they're going to use that evidence to discuss and draw up practice protocols and to monitor how effective those protocols are by audit and by significant event reviews. So, when we're all in practice having our coffee break and we're discussing cases, where do we find the evidence? I think um, when I qualified, which was um, a, few year, a few years after Jeff, but I was very young as well. <laughs> so, yeah, and there's some people from my year here. And when I qualified, if we wanted to look at the evidence, there were probably a couple of textbooks and... Um, you know, there was the VET record and JSAP and a few other journals we might look in. But now, there's a monstrous amount of, of evidence out there on the internet. And we know, don't we, from clients that come in with one of those printouts about this thick, telling us that they know what's wrong with their cat and haven't we thought of da-da-da. We, so we know how unreliable a lot of that evidence is. So what I'd really like to come out of this is that practitioners can find out how to easily find evidence they can rely on because they're going to make changes as a result of this. Thank you.